Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of Sunflower Sutras. I'm your host, Tara. To start things today, I would like to read Ad Verona by Oscar Wilde. How steep the stairs within king's houses are, for exile wearied feet is mine to tread, and oh, how salt and bitter is the bread which falls from his hound's table, better far that I had died in the red ways of war, or at the gate of Florence bare my head, than to live thus by all things camaraded, which seek the essence of my soul to mar. Curse God and die, what better hope than this? He hath forgotten thee in all this bliss of his gold city and eternal day. Nay, peace, behind my prison's blinded bars, I do possess what none can take away, my love and all the glory of the stars. And with us in the studio today, via wonderful phone connection, is KC poet Jen Harris. Hello, how are you? I'm fine. How are you doing after such a busy, chaotic weekend? <laughs> I'm doing well. I, uh, I feel very fortunate to live a pretty creative freedom life. So I will take the exhaustion out of Monday for the, the fun times on the weekend. <laughs> for our uh, audience at home, would you so mm-hmm. kindly introduce yourself and give us a little bit about your background? Absolutely. Um, I My name is Jen Harris. I go by poet Jen Harris, um, mainly because I couldn't think of a creative stage name. <laughs> I am a professional um, writer and speaker. I do spoken word poetry was my first introduction into this world, and it's still something I work on and with every single day. Um, I'm an activist in the LGBTQ community, and I'm a published author and a founder and former host of the Kansas City Poetry Slam. I got started in poetry in uh, 2012 in Berkeley, California, and I just really fell in love with it. And in the last six years, I have gone from being a junkie in California to being a national award-winning poet. I gave a TED Talk on how spoken word poetry saved my life. I've really become the best version of myself through this art form. So I, I hold it very dear, and I spend most of my life with or around it. I remember the first time that we met. It was a couple years back at the writer's place. And the quick little introduction that they did about you, I was immediately smitten because you sounded so cool back and forth between Kansas and California. And you had this really awesome piece about being this kind of chaotic youth coming out and I'd never seen someone so abrasive at the same time so kind of fragile you are not the first woman to say that to me (laughs) I appreciate your kindness I um I was a very chaotic youth I I have spent most of my life trying to figure out what the meaning of it all is and I'm definitely the kind of person that Um, I would rather pick up and leave and explore and have any and every adventure than I would, I guess, stay put. And for a long time, that that led me down a lot of, I think, dangerous and chaotic paths um, as I've aged. And I'm in my mid-30s now, and I think that I have kind of worn myself out with uh, doing and going and being without giving like honor and acknowledgement to my own vulnerabilities and also to wanting roots. I never really had roots. I grew up in a, a very religious military family, so I understood community in regards to church, and I didn't really understand home. We didn't stay any place for very long, and I think that in my life it made it very easy for me to just get up and go whenever something sounded really interesting um, or just, you know, completely opposite of what I was doing at that moment. Um, I've always wanted to wear kind of every every mask and every suit you can possibly wear in life. Um, but I don't think that it's done me a lot of favors in regards to protecting myself from the harshness of the world. I really have slowed down to concentrate on developing community and developing roots and, and understanding myself and letting that fragility that is part of my human experience be seen. 
I think I spent a long time being very tough and very uh, disassociated or disconnected from the effects, the chaos of my seeking left in my life. And that was what I spent most of my time introspecting and writing about, is how it affected me and how it continues to affect me. I'm thinking back to your book, Slammed, and specifically the cover photo for Slammed. It's a picture of you, and you're nude except for being covered in several different descriptors, waitress, dyke, several other different things, but chief among them, you've got tape over your mouth, and it says poet. Yes. I think that photo, I mean, I took that photo... In my in my living room, um, you know, this world of selfie portraits has really, I think a lot of people speak ill of selfies, but I think it's a really interesting technological development that um, we really look at ourselves and we want to, we want to present the best version of ourselves. And I, I don't think I have ever really subscribed to any notion of beauty that is commercialized. I think I, I am very interested and drawn to people and experiences that require you to be naked and be seen and also this kind of self-imposed silence. I mean, my the tape across my mouth in full, when you look at the whole photo head on, says speak, poet. So it's that juxtaposition of knowing that I have a voice and a purpose and a place in this world and feeling so stifled by the things that I, I feel are kind of etched into my skin. You know, I've I've been told by people uh, countless times over the last six years that my work gave language to their experience that they were having, and they have called me, you know, a hero in their life or, you know, some sort of lifesaver. And the truth is I never really set out to be that person. I set out to... I didn't set out to even have an impact. I set out to get myself sober and get myself... I don't know, functional in this world. I I wanted to understand what I was carrying around. And, you know, a lot of people have connected really intensely and emotionally to uh, the truth that I tell in the way that I tell it. And, you know, some people think that I'm a really loud, angry bull dyke that doesn't want uh, men to be visible or successful or seen. I think I come across in my own experience as very angry. And I am very angry. But at the same time, that anger is uh, housing a lot of vulnerability and fragility that really didn't have a chance to breathe or be seen uh, for most of my life because I was just trying to carve out a place for myself as a queer, often masculine identifying youth, but I'm not a trans man and I'm not a man. I don't know. I I didn't want to be any particular stereotype, but I think people kept telling me I was for so long. But in that photo, I really wanted to present the juxtaposition of you know, how I actually feel versus what I look like. Throughout Slammed, you have several pieces that I kept reading and I kept thinking, oh my God, this piece. But then I'd read the uh, the next one and then that one would be my next favorite. And the one in particular, though, that stands out to me so much because again like you were saying a lot of people can just relate to your material well it's true the piece about being in your work lunch area and just being totally pissed and being juxtaposed between being an artist and being stuck in a working class hell are you talking about shit job yep. or <laughs> yeah i mean <laughs> that um i grew up in a military family, and my mother had three children with my father very young, and so she often worked really odd hours to try and help bring money in for our family, and my father was a military cop, so he was, he worked, you know, a range of hours, but I didn't see him very often, and I kind of entered the world in the same way that they did. Once my father left the military, my family ran a dairy farm for a farmer in Kansas, and I don't know, I was introduced to the world of work very young. I grew up in pretty serious poverty, and we were these very, like, resentful, salt-of-the-earth people. You know, we wanted to get ahead in life, but nobody seemed to understand how. And I entered the world working part-time at, I think, age 12, and by 14, I was working full-time, and I've worked every 
any job you can possibly imagine. <laughs> there is not a, a fast food restaurant or a, a hotel or a retail chain that I haven't worked at for at least eight hours. And I just could not stand the way I felt in those spaces, in those, in living that life, looking around thinking, even one day here, everybody who's been here for five years, 10 years, 20 years, had a first day. And like, did they think on that first day that they would be here 20 years from now? And the answer is always no. Nobody wants to be a server at Pizza Hut at, at 55. And I just couldn't accept the simplicity of that life. I couldn't expect the limitation or accept the limitations of that kind of life. And, you know, that led me to serving and waitressing at high end restaurants where I could make a lot of money very quickly. And that led me to bartending. And, you know, finally, when I decided that I would go to college, uh, I went to college thinking I would have like an exciting but reliable journalism job for the rest of my life. And then journalism at the time in which I was in college made a tremendous transition from print media to everything being on the internet because the internet really became an all-encompassing encyclopedia for knowledge and communication in my mid-20s, and that changed everything. Print journalism died basically the year I was finished with that program, and yeah, it, it hurts. It's terrifying because you have to you have to keep up with technology now in order to be relevant in the media world. And I have done a really good job on my own of maintaining the core skill sets and also keeping up with the times. You know, I'm very, I'm very fluent in the Adobe suites and I'm very aware of SEO ratings on Google and I, I can learn these things and keep up. But you know, this, it wasn't the journalism that I imagined. And then when I looked at that experience and realized that, you know, a hundred bucks a story wasn't cutting it for freelance journalism, I had to figure out something else that would give me both the fulfillment that writing does and a reliable income. And I mean, from there on out, I, I only took jobs that nurtured my creativity and in some way were associated with literature and human relation and public relations and I just, I want to create and I want to build and I want to bring things to life that, um, I want to bring things to life in a way that I believe that journalism could. So I keep, I keep trying to find that and carve it out for myself in this world. This leads me to a kind of two pronged question. Number one, I've for a few years now been curious about the transition or just the balancing for you between being a very active performance artist, but also writing like carbon copy format, like the difference between performing for you and writing and which one comes first and foremost, or if they're both equal. But also what you were talking about just makes me curious about how much you like managing yourself currently uh, with uh, your recent exploration into Patreon. Oh, man. Well, I, you know, the dream for me is to basically be Anne Lamott or Julia Cameron or Natalie Goldberg. And they're kind of, I love all of those women and the work that they have written over the years. And I see them finally succeeding on like a, a national and a global scale now. And they're like in anywhere between their late 50s and their like, you know, early 70s. I want to write from the deepest parts of myself and deliver that manuscript to a publisher and that be the end of my my contribution to the literary world. I love performing because it, it infuses, my voice can infuse and fluctuate the truth and intonate the truth in the way that I heard it in my head. So I'm able to deliver what I felt, exactly how I felt it, and it leaves, it doesn't leave, not leave room for personal interpretation, but it leaves less doubt about what I meant. Because the thing I hated most in college was the analyzing of a poet's work. I just thought like, oh my God, you know why they wrote this? Because there was some muse, some freight train of a noise running through their mind, and this was the alleviation of that freight train. It's like, just dramatic interruption of their day. I, I feel like I have to write every day. I feel 
um, like something's almost whispering to me, giving me a first line or a phrase that I'm supposed to build something around. And my responsibility is just to honor that. But being able to perform, being able to perform and travel, which has funded a lot of my travel, which I love to do, has been a great gift. Uh, but it, performing is very, very emotionally exhausting. And writing is, but in a different way. Writing, I get it all out of me and I'm somehow restored. Performing, I perform and then I kind of have to immediately introvert and more or less make a quick escape because I'm, I'm so tired emotionally when I'm done giving that message. I don't know. I love both of them for different reasons, but the dream would be to write full time without much interaction because I'm truly a very introverted person and my most extroverted moments are on the stage and then with the people that have attended to see me afterward and then I'm going to go recover silently for 48 hours. If you, especially if you are in the area, Kansas City specifically, if you want to be connected to the world, my God, there's no better source than the brain droppings and musings of Jen Harris. I absolutely loved your your rant that you had about the gentrification thing that was happening recently. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I um I live in the Crossroads district of Kansas City and um you know this used to be a really dangerous shitty neighborhood that nobody wanted to be in and that's why we loved being down here because I was spray painting with graffiti all the time because I'm not a visual artist but there are just phases in my life where I have to make something with my hands and I wanted to make visual art and I've always admired graffiti and we were down here and we would you know I would tag everything and I would spray paint abandoned buildings and I would just walk around and think my thoughts and Nobody would bother us, you know, we could just smoke joints and walk around, and it was wonderful. But now, the Crossroads is the place to be, you know, the, the Kaufman Center for the Performing Arts is here, and that's, you know, in almost direct comparison to the Sydney Opera House, and it, it's extraordinary. Um, but now all the hip coffee shops and bars are down here, and everything's cleaned up, and it's, it's nicer, and it sure is... Uh, it's starting to homogenize in a way that makes me very sad because I think we, when we knock down an old building to put a new cookie cutter shitty one on top of it, we erase our history and we make it impossible for people that have been supporting or living in this city for a long time to stay here for an extended period of time. You know, I'm really fortunate to live in an art gallery or above an art gallery in the crossroads, which was a dream of mine since I was a kid. But I live in a pretty... I don't want to say state of panic, but a sense of anxiety about one day being pushed out of this space because now that since we went ahead and made it cool by holding art shows and concerts in the street and, you know, having these eclectic places to visit, um, everybody wanted to be a part of it and then they don't realize that when you all, like, storm the gates, you kind of ruin it. It's intimidating. So I, I don't know, I, I love Kansas City and I love my neighborhood, but... They have shoved out so many good businesses that have been here for a very long time. For what? For the sake of progress? So that they can raise the rent? So they can squeeze a bunch of people into uh, tiny places rather than letting artists and business owners have large square footage despite the, I guess, the way in which they could charge for that square footage? This is very frustrating. Like, we shouldn't have to worry that when the building changes hands, the neighborhood changes faces, in my opinion. And I find it really disgusting that these people come in and buy up all the real estate because they can. And without giving consideration to history or residents, they decide that they know what's best for the area. It's just fucking gross. So I won't sit down and be quiet about it, even if there's not much I can do about it most of the time. And this is why I keep coming back. I absolutely love this kind of commentary. <laughs> I want progress in my city. I want a public transportation system people can rely on because, you know, I have an old crappy car that some of my brother bought for me that I share with my best friend because we have chosen to make art over everything else. So I have given up the security of a day job that provides a, a bi-weekly paycheck and I have given up the sense that I don't ever have a backup plan. 
plan for emergencies and I recently got a kitten and I'm just like anytime he even looks like slightly dehydrated I'm like oh god please don't need to go to the vet because I can't afford to take you like I've given up everything to be honest and true to myself in a creative way I want my city to progress I want to be able to walk to coffee shops and the post office and jump on public transit to get to a job if I have to take one and I want to be able to do all those things but I don't want to push out the history and the original residents from these areas just because now it's prettier and a little less eclectic. I think everybody that comes in and buys real estate treats a well-worn neighborhood like a place that needs a good whitewashing and it's just super gross. Yes. Basically... Every weekend that I've seen, you're going on social media and talking about all these different events that you're hosting, that you're going to be a part of. Like you are constantly working 24 seven just to bring the art to the forefront and to uh, specifically to do rewards for your patrons. I've spent a lot of time in this community now, and sometimes, I'll, like, I moved to Denver for six months uh, last year to be with someone I was in love with, and I sometimes I need to get out of here and take a break from my city, but I come back, and I'm restored, and I am, I'm better, and I'm different, and I can create more work, and I've gone to every show and every gallery, and I, I want to celebrate what this city is doing, and I want to support art in this city. In that, I've met a lot of really amazing people, and so now I'm being commissioned to write poems for, um, like I recently wrote and performed a poem for this shop called Fine Folk, and they had their five-year anniversary, and I sat down with the owner and um, her partner and asked them, like, tell me about why this shop exists, tell me what it means to you to have been here for five years, and what what message you're trying to send to people. You know, it ended up being a really beautiful piece that had nothing to do with consumerism. You know, there's all this intention behind people's work. And earlier this year, I wrote 11 poems based on my interviews with, I think, 14 people who were living with cancer or dying from cancer. And I did that in conjunction with the Gilda's Club Cancer Center in Kansas City. And we had a four-night run of those shows with the Owen Cox Dance Company dancing behind my poetry. And also that poetry was put to music by Stacey Bush, who's a local composer. And those shows were incredible. And I had the opportunity to do what I love to do, but to do it in the context of making, of raising awareness for resources and really kind, generous, intentional people in this city. And I think that is a really beautiful aspect of my work that would not exist in my life if I hadn't been out busking and performing poetry on the streets and performing poetry in bars and, you know, telling people, like, I know what you think of poetry based on your high school experience with it, but that's not the kind of poetry I write and that's not the kind of performance I give. So here's my card. Look me up. Listen to my work and call me when it's relevant to you. And I'm continuously surprised at how People want to commission me to create work to communicate what they can't. And in that, I love my job. I remember the uh, CD launch party for Matt Speech's Babylon. Yeah. And mm-hmm. by no means am I dissing you, Matt. But when you came up, because they, of course, asked you to come because okay. I love you. That performance cemented in my mind just how much Kansas City loves you because you basically stole the show. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. I, Matt Spezia, God bless him. I love that man. We we met at a very early age in my poetry experience and, you know, Matt has an ambition and a drive and a commitment that I, her love's my own and it's pretty rare for me to find somebody else in this world who works as hard as I do. And and I, and I don't say that with any ego. I just know that I'm willing to put in the work because I know that, that this life that I've chosen takes constant and consistent work. And the people that I collaborate with daily, monthly, whatever area in which we work together, those people do what I do and they sacrifice everything to make art. And so with Matt, You know, he has found a way to honor his artistic side and his creative elements, you know, while also uh, 
putting himself through college and creating amazing citywide, like Topeka citywide programs. And he's just, he's an extraordinary talent. And I, I love him for it. I love him for, for asking me and for working so hard. And he's won multiple national awards now. And like, he's just kicking ass at everything he touches. And I feel really honored to be included in that because I know how hard he works. And I don't say yes to performances or participate in events where I don't feel like the people who are also there are making as much effort or aren't making as much effort as I am. I really, ha- I really believe in the people that I show up and support. I don't think that either one of you actually sleep. <laughs> no, you know what? I, I, this year has been a great challenge for me for um, a, really adopting self-care uh, techniques and behaviors and honoring when I'm tired and when I don't have anything else to give. But there's a certain level that you learn to operate on that might seem like workaholic level for some people. That's just like an easy day for me. You know, today I I posted on Instagram for a client of mine. I sent some artwork that I created to another client. I posted on Patreon a couple of times. I had a meeting. I dropped off a friend who had been here all weekend to assist me with gigs at (laughs) Greyhound. And like now, I'm calling into your podcast, and that's a that's a light day for me. Oh <laughs> so my goodness! I, uh, <laughs> like that, that's a light day because I think you can accomplish. I think people can accomplish so much more in a day if they prioritize what actually makes them happy. And when I'm working a shitty nine to five or a three to eleven or whatever the hell shit that I'm working, and I come home from that, my spirit is depleted. And I don't have any creative energy to give the world. But I can work 15 hours a day making art all day long and feel like it was nothing at all. So I think there's some sort of fueling that comes from personal commitment to your craft that's just really undeniable for me. I know I'm doing what I was meant to do, and I love what I do. I I really respect that. It takes a lot of courage to actually do that, especially being in a capitalist society that makes you feel like you're a loser or a mooch or any other negative adjective if you're not participating in the nine to five grind oh absolutely i mean i spend a lot of my emotional energy just being like you haven't failed you haven't failed you haven't failed because i take the same attitude with my career that i take with my romantic relationships which is if i'm unhappy i'm not doing this anymore and i am constantly trying to work on myself to have the best experience possible. And I'm also really trying to to honor what's important to me. And I just cannot, I can't give up on those things. I can't give up on being the best version of myself. And I can't give up on being act, an active participant in the journey. And I'm glad that you haven't given up. Thank you. It's a, I feel like poetry saved my life. It gave me a place to process and I really needed that place. And I think a lot of people are that way. You know, we're all pretty blown away by the effect that going to an open mic or to a slam or even to just a, a, you know, poetry in the round reading, like you can be really phenomenally moved and you can consider perspectives you've never had before, whether you've never had to consider them or you couldn't even imagine thinking about that subject for any particular reason. Like poetry is powerful and it illuminates human connection. And I think that that's incredibly important. And on that note, if you could do us the honors, would you mind performing a piece or two? I wouldn't mind. I um, thank you so much for everything. I really appreciate you having me on today. So this weekend, Friday night, I debuted um, what I call the Poetry Fort at the drugstore where I'm a writer in residence. I did the geometric playground dome and I covered it in tons of sheets like kids sheets and built this really beautiful fort inside and outside and I released this chat book called Pinky Swear and a lot of it has to do with metaphors for the fort so I'm going to read you a couple of pieces from that and the first one is a letter and it says Dear P I wish we'd met when we were kids so we could steal Nike shoes together and sing each other songs in the absence of fancy discomments. If we knew each other then, maybe we wouldn't have known loneliness so young. Maybe not having fathers would have been more tolerable somehow, and maybe we would have made a pact to never drink or do drugs or fall in love with anyone but each other because how could anyone understand quite the way we do? 
I wish we, we'd met before coping skills became our first language. I bet if you kissed me before you knew how to set your curls, I would have worn overalls and planted gardens all my life. Maybe I'd still be a writer and maybe you'd still be a doctor and maybe we wouldn't have crossed this country breaking everything we couldn't have just so no one else could have it either. I wish our mothers had said half the shit to themselves that they said to us. I wish no one had said anything at all about roles and expectations, about accepting defeat before ever understanding the battle. I wish we'd never been called to war, drafted by our gender and childhoods. We have both killed so many people with our bare words, not realizing our empty hands were the problem, marred from carrying everyone else's shatter that when the time came to know one another, our innocence had been fashioned into blades, and we both did what we had both always done in the face of love. Fought. Fought for space no one was trying to take. Fought to be right when there weren't any sides. I wish we could have fought over where to pitch the fort. Which flashlight would shine bright enough for both of us to read ourselves to sleep. We could have taken shifts, being the lookout for angry stomps and open palms. Lights out at the slightest vibration of rage, quick, snore a little, hold my hand under the covers, pretend to be what we were never given the chance to be. Little girls, little girls, little girl, I miss you every day. This next one is called, I knew she was in love with me. I knew she was in love with me well before she said it. I saw it happen. Watched love punch her right in the mouth as she leaned over me, licking her lips, panting. Her tongue was practically a bloody valentine of holding back words. I didn't try to coax it out of her, me being all tobacco stains and calluses. I sat on a bar stool at the intersection of here and now and ignored it because it wasn't mine to say I saw, and besides, it was too soon anyway. We still have joint accounts with other people. I knew I was really in love with her the first time she filled my ice cube trays. It's as if my ties were never taut. Buttons were always off by one. I'd stay in this den of succulents and chipping paint if she wasn't always luring me out with garter belts, taunting me with smudge-proof lipsticks and various hues of smoldering. I didn't want to be in love again if it meant another round of catch me as you can. I can't. I'm perfectly content to be all watch band and cuffed sleeves, sleeping next to red ink editing pens, fancying myself some sort of bohemian George Clooney, but even George got lonely. Even George let love in. And besides, what fool says no to the most exhilarating trip of a lifetime when they've still got parts of themselves to spare? Thank you so much for reading those. Those were really powerful pieces. Thank you so much. I am um, definitely still posting on Patreon, and I'm trying to get caught up enough in my life to be able to release a couple of more books. I am self-publishing now, so I am definitely intending to get books out to the public. Um, but I think it'll be 2019 before that happens at this point. And where are some sites that our listeners can uh, reach you and your work at? I would definitely encourage everybody to go to patreon.com. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash poet Jen Harris, uh, because that's where I'm most active. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. Um, I have a Reverb Nation page where you can listen to my album that I released a couple of years ago. Um, I don't have any more books for sale at this time, but I do make chat books from time to time, and I post those often for sale on social media and on Patreon. So I think that would be the best place to go. Poet Jen Harris, everyone. Thank you so much, Terry. I appreciate you all very much. And thank you very much. And now for our listener submissions. This week's poetry is brought to us by poet Jesse Bradley. Jesse Bradley is the two-time winner of Wigleaf's Top 50 Very Short Fictions. He is also the author of Neil and Other Stories by Whiskey Lit Books. You can follow him and his poetry at jbradleywrites.com. The rib cage recognizes patterns and yet keeps ignoring them. Love is a circle. You say as this week's want caresses one neck after the other. 
You wait for him to sleep before you skitter into his bathroom. You catalog his faults, plan for the right escape, the one where you are a corpse waiting for the right kiss to reanimate you. The rib cage interviews for a job it needs, not that it wants. You notice the recruiter kept a straight face when you skitter into the interview room. You want to ask what other horrors she's seen, but you don't. The recruiter asks, how would you be a good fit for our company? You search for the work-safe version of your history, emphasize how much of a people person you are, how you enjoy collaboration, innovation, even synergy. You tap your tips on the armrests to maintain your focus. The recruiter asks, what's your biggest weakness? You thank the interviewer for her time, skitter out to the lobby. In the elevator, you say him. On the bus ride home, you say the need to break any silence with his mouth. To the bathroom mirror, you say the wait between the last name and the next. And finally, the rib cage becomes stranded on a deserted island. It takes 37 days to write Send Conversation. You use all your tips to make the letters fat and wet in the sand. You wait for the lover you fashioned, for his coconut mouth to open, for him to sigh when you caress his stone-stacked stomach, for him to cry when you finally leave him. Thank you so much for that poetry, Jesse, And thank you all, listeners, for spending time with us this week. And remember, if you or someone you know would like to submit poetry to our show, want to have a talk with us, a book recommendation, whatever it might be, feel free to send us a message at our Facebook page, Sunflower Sutras. Otherwise, you can submit poetry directly to me at tara.bartley at yahoo.com. I want your story, specifically yours. I don't care if you think you're boring, if you think your life is too complicated, I don't care if there's hang-ups, I don't care if there's rejections. What I do care about is that you are heard. Again, thank you so much for spending your time with us this week. Salonga fall and farewell. <laughs>